uh, I actually didn't read this. I, I uh, listened to it as an audio book. It was the Constance Garnet translation, and it didn't strike me as an impressive text, but I could tell right away that even if the translation was like just like a bad translation, it probably would not be the case that the book uh, would be, you know, a, a great sort of like Russian classic. And that, there's like structural reasons for, uh, for that, that like no translation could even save. Um, there's the fact that there's not sufficient time spent with uh, some of these characters in terms of like, really developing them. Uh, there's not uh, sufficient uh, uh, time to, I mean, there's not even, so forget the time, there's not sufficient effort expended. Like, even if you don't have the time, you shouldn't have caricatures of characters, right? And uh, so, like, the, the book starts with Ivan, right, who is, uh, what is he, like a, a lawyer or a judge? He's like one of these bureaucrats that it's not sufficiently clear that his existence and his salary necessarily uh, makes Russia a better place at the time, right? You could say the same thing for a lot of American bureaucrats, whatever, European bureaucrats, you know, like, like Chinese bureaucrats, it's like a, it's a common enough critique, but you know, whatever, fine. That would be like the context. Um, and it begins with his, uh, essentially his funeral, he's dead, people are looking at his body. And from the beginning, like his wife is just presented as a total shrew, totally self self absorbed, totally just trying to like you know make money uh, off of this death. Uh, clearly, does not really care about him at all. There's nothing that actually happens later in the text that offsets that. Like there's no complication. It's it's kind of similar to um, when I did with Joel Parrish when I did that artifact early on. Uh, John Williams uh, he wrote that that novel Stoner about an academic who marries this like total like harpy of a wife who seems to also just be like very mentally ill. And um, she's just like such a caricature that, uh, I mean like it's one thing that there's enough good writing in the book where it's not gonna be a bad book. Uh, it's not like a sin that's grave enough where like you can't read that book, like fuck it, like it's a waste of time. But uh, still, I mean, it, uh, she, she is a caricature, right? She, like uh, the, the one time that she becomes like physically affectionate is when she decides she wants to have a baby and then it's completely over and then she's, she's never uh, warm and affectionate again, neither to him nor her daughter, daughter who's eventually born of this. So, you know, um, you know it's, the, that part is bad writing. And here it's bad writing in another way. Granted, it, the, it's not as cliched, but you know, it's as trite, you know, equally, I guess, in another direction. Uh, I did, in fact, like, uh, w uh, like w when I was reading it uh, a second time in, in Russian, I was listening to it. I actually thought like the second time that I was reading it, cause like the book ends with Ivan essentially saying, oh, um, you know, although like uh, he knows that he's dying, death itself, becomes something that disappears, which I mean, you could sort of like debate a little bit in and of itself in the sense that uh, you already had Buddhist writing at the time that maybe if not said that directly or exactly in that way, at least pointed in that direction. So it's not a totally like novel idea, but let's just grant the idea that it is an interesting way to discuss death, right? And dying, the death itself disappears right in the process uh, of death. And he's not screaming, he's not crying, he's not, you know, he's totally taking it in stride in that way, in a very kind of manly, dignified fashion, uh, with sort of some sort of intellectual understanding. It's almost as if the intellectual understanding for Ivan is what produces the kind of emotional uh, uh, strength, right? Um, so, so then the second time when I was listening to, this time in Russian, and uh, the narration basically uh, had the wife uh, tell one of his friends, like, Oh, and he was, you know, it was just impossible to be around him, right? He was, you know, he was crying, he was screaming. And I was like, oh, that's an, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily deepen her character all that much. But, you know, she is sort of lying about exactly what his own ending was. And the only way you would know that is if you already had read the text, right? So it's in those ways where I said, like, look, if it's good writing, a second reading would reveal details about character and description, whatever it might be, that is interesting, like, in and of itself. But uh, upon, you know, like reading to the very end, I still had the sense that, you know, he, he is described as somebody that's screaming. So like that opportunity that Tolstoy had, he had the opportunity to like maybe enrich her character just a tiny bit. And he, he still didn't take that. So I was kind of snickered in that way, right? He kind of gave himself a way out, but he, he still didn't take it. So I found that a little bit disappointing. So th there's this phrase that occurs uh, in Russian. So in terms of like translation, right, to get to that aspect of it, uh, I mean, obviously, like reading this in Russian is going to be more pleasant than a translation, especially kind of like a, a stuffy type of translation like Constance Garnett. Uh, at the same time, you know, like what does this exactly amount to? So there's a, there's a phrase that's like pleasant enough 
uh, to the Russian ear that it comes up as a motif again and again. Uh, Priyatna, Prilichna, right? Uh, the idea that um, Ivan, as he's you know getting uh, ahead in life and he's like making more money, he's getting this house and he's impressing you know his family and friends with. Um, you know, what turns out to be like cheap furniture and stuff, but it's like stuff that they would consider to be like very sort of like a, a, a ritzy or whatever. There's this like motif that comes up where like he keeps thinking like, oh, uh, but everything in my life was priyatna i prilichna, meaning pleasant and proper, right? Pleasant and becoming of me, of who I am. And it comes up again and again. It's supposed to serve as a kind of motif, and it sounds nice to the ear. It could work, actually. I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't. It's not a cliche or anything like that. But at the same time, beyond the fact that this is a guy that wants something that's like Priyatna and Prilichna for his life, there's no actual like development beyond this, right? And, I mean, it serves a little bit uh, uh, of a function in the sense that you know, you could argue about like, okay, is it good characterization or bad characterization that Tolstoy makes Ivan somebody who is, you know, like, like, okay, so if he's, if he's somebody that is dying and he's now having these understandings, like, did I really live my life appropriately, right? Was there something that I missed, right? Was there something that I, I could have done that was more? I think it's actually a good detail, maybe in the abstract at least, that it's never actually explained where this other thing could have been. Because most people, you know, I would imagine that, you know, many people in general, they probably do fight some level of like purpose, purposelessness, right? They do fight like a lack of purpose. They do fight the idea that, you know, what exactly am I doing in my life? And they don't necessarily have the answer, right? Maybe they do have the answer later on. Maybe if Ivan lives long enough, he would have the answer. But very often people don't have an answer to that question. They don't have an answer to that conundrum. And there's nothing wrong with that. You could potentially put that into art. And the fact that, um, you know, he's struggling with the question, but he doesn't really provide the answer. And he doesn't even low, know what the contours, uh, what the architecture of this answer would look like. You know, I think, I think it's, a, it's a nice little trick, right? It's a good writerly trick. The reason why I'm saying and offering these caveats and saying like, well, in the abstract, it's good is you probably still should have, if not, like even if you don't want to characterize him so deeply that it's like, oh my God, he has so much depth to him. Uh, Cause like, it's not really who he is, right? He's not supposed to be deep. But even if that's the case, shouldn't you still have like, I mean like Tom Driscoll, right? And Puddinghead Wilson, he's not deep, but you have enough details. Like even when he's like, kind of like barely like struggling a little bit with himself, like before he, he always like ends that struggle, right? About like, you know, like what is like, why, why do black people exist? What is this weird thing? You know, what is this? Why, why, why? Even if he's not allowed that kind of depth, you, you still remember that, that monologue that's beginning, even if you remember it solely for the purpose that it gets cut off. There's not sufficient details about Ivan that really would make, you, make him somebody that sticks with you, right? Even if they're negative details, right? So this is why, why I say, like, it, it is a good strategy in Tolstoy. This is why, like, I, I'm not going to call this a bad book. It's not a bad book in English or in Russian. Even in English, you will find, even in a, in a not, you know, great translation like, like Constance Garnet, you will still find enough stuff going on structurally where it's like, it's interesting. It's, it's worth the read, right? It's, it's solid to good at the very least. Uh, there's, like, another little motif, right? The servant right so Ivan Servan is the only one that's kind to him and you know it's not necessarily a cliche it wouldn't be a cliche in, in Mark Twain it's not a, a cliche here but it might be a cliche for the purposes of uh, uh, Tolstoy's output right he had the you know he he released his own servants he um had like all these like moral queries both about slavery as well as the uh, uh, serfdom in Russia uh, and you know, like by the time that we get to this stage in his writing, it, it gets enough coverage in his writing where it becomes almost like a cliche from book to book, right? Within the context of book to book. Maybe not a cliche for the purposes of the rest of the world, but the idea of uh, the servant almost as a kind of like a bit of a noble savage, right? Someone that this is going to be the one that's kind. Whereas like in Dostoevsky, you have... Uh, uh, servants that are very kind of like snippy, right? You have servants like in, in uh, um, Notes from Underground that uh, understand the weaknesses of their masters and they exploit them. I think, you know, in some ways the, the servant might be one of the more interesting characters in the book. But at the same time, within the context of like Tolstoy from book to book, we are approaching the territory of, you know, why, why, why do you keep doing this? Especially if like, 
it's not like it's not as if like, the servant has so much characterization, so many like details and situations where it's like, wow, yeah, that's a classic character. You'll remember him, right? So it's just kind of covering philosophical territory for the sake of covering philosophical territory. And this is actually often, you know, what Tolstoy does um, from uh, uh, from book to book. There is like a, a little funny detail about his wife, but uh, it's not done enough where uh, it would like justify her as a character where uh, she starts to you know, detest her life and she tar- starts to, because she doesn't want to take care of a sick husband and whatnot, but she's like very selfish in that way. And to read a caricature, that aspect of her, where it becomes like actual, like writerly caricature, not just like cheap caricature. It's sort of, uh, Tolstoy says something like, uh, you know, she, you know, she felt so bad that she wanted to die, but ultimately knew that she couldn't die because uh, that self-pity was so pleasurable right that self-pity was something that she loved so much that was like her one pleasure in life that no she couldn't die right this is the thing that allow her to live which you know some novel way of thinking about things um it turns away a little bit from uh not so much the character as a caricature but the fact that as a caricature it wasn't like a writerly caricature right it's not caricature uh, as like um you know if you think about like various like literary techniques caricature is one right that's not that's, that's not in of itself bad but uh it's not writerly caricature in that regard right this is not like a, a literary device that he's using here okay so s- some of this uh, uh diction so th- so this is you know it's not just constant garnet right this is in the russian these are literal translations from from the russian these are cliches in russian as they are in english uh eyes without light black as night only heard the beating of his heart in the depths of his soul the fire extinguished extinguished in his eyes i'm not going to say that these kinds of uh, uh, items are frequent enough that they totally disrupt the novel but they happen and they happen frequently enough that you know i'm going to remember like you know uh, I, i'm not going to remember so many details of this book but five years from now if you ask me oh what'd you think about death of ivan illich and i'll say oh yeah i i read it in uh, english and then russian and both the English and the Russian, you know, it, ha- it had cliches, right? I would definitely remember that, right? This is something that I've trained myself to, like, remember about a text or a painting or whatever, right? To what extent is it novel? To what extent is it just kind of uh, retreading, you know, the same territory again and again? So th- there are some parts, I think, that are just rioterly very good, even though they retread some some uh, similar territory. I forget if War and Peace was written before or after this text, but in War and Peace... Uh, the one thing that I do remember about the book is when one of the characters is at war and he's just kind of like, he's like on the ground. I don't know if he's been like knocked off a horse or what it was, but uh, he, he's on the ground and he's remembering uh, his childhood and he sees like a, a French soldier coming towards him as if to kill him. And he thinks like, what? This, this soldier wants to come and kill me? Me? How? Why? How is that possible? And then he says his name, uh, like his own name, like me? who everybody loved, you know, like he's kind of like totally kind of going off his rocker a little bit, right? Because he can't believe this is about to transpire. And that's very memorable. I've always remembered, you know, I didn't remember much about War and Peace. Grant, I I read when I was a teenager and only once. Uh, There's probably more good stuff in there. It's long, you know, Tolstoy is talented enough and the book is long enough that you'll find good stuff in there when you look for it. But as far as what I remember, having read as a teenager, it's that specific scene. And he has something similar here where so he's kind of going, you know, he's dying. He's going through his head, like uh, his memory of uh, his like intellectual work or, or whatever. And it was like, you know, I remember like the syllogisms of my youth. Uh, Kai is immortal. All mortals die. Therefore, Kai is going to die. Um, and he thinks like, well, I understand the logic, right? I've been trained on this logic. I went to school for this logic. I totally get it. But the one thing that I don't understand about this logic, this syllogism, is the fact that this applies to Kai, but this can't possibly apply to me, right? Me, who has my friends, my memories, my childhood, me who, you know, loved my mother a certain way or loved like a certain piece of food a certain way. And he has like those like little details about childhood or whatever that that also sticks to you. So like in terms of what I'm going to remember about this book, this is also something I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember about the commonality with War and Peace. And I'm going to remember how this specifically, this gets treated here. This thing that is perfectly logical that he knows is logical, that he knew was always coming. Death was always coming. Uh, the syllogism breaks as soon as it applies to him, right? It's a wonderful way to sketch out, you know, that element of his life. And there's also a little bit of like symbolism that is, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, it's both good and bad. So, like, one of the good parts is uh, his sickness begins when he's he's putting up curtains in his new house, 
and he falls down. He doesn't. He hurts himself just a little bit, but he marvels at how, oh, look, you know how much fitter, fitter I got, right? I did not hurt myself. I'm athletic. You know, I'm older, but still I feel like I've regained my youth, like being in this new house and doing this, doing that. And um, despite this fact, uh, his kidney, you know, begins to sort of give out, right? So it kind of is the start of this disease or whatever it is that starts to progress. And as it's progressing, there's like enough space though between the accident and the, the start of the disease where you forget about the fact that he fell. So in terms of like a rereading, you might even like not even remember the fact that he fell and you might not even make the connection until you do a second reading. So. You know, every once in a while, like, yeah, you do come across a detail like that. That that part part of it is good. That distance is good. At the same time, I mean, I mean, think about the symbolism of he's in this house, right? Uh, the whole kind of conflict is he's totally like you know self-involved, middle class, you know, bourgeois life, upper middle class, whatever. A useless bureaucrat dealing with um, not knowing what to do about life, not knowing how to deal with himself. He starts to die precisely when he starts to hang up what he thinks are expensive but are really like cheap looking curtains in his house right i mean um and then like he has this kind of this uh i forget what it's called like tashnata like this uh this nausea in his in his uh throat right this bitterness that comes up so he can't he can't like eat the food the that kind of food that he used to eat and it's like you know it's kind of that symbolism is a little ham-fisted and the ending, the ending is pretty good, right? The, by the death disappearing. But even there, there's like some like funky diction, even in the Russian, right? Uh, eventually there was not death, but light. You know, I mean, it's, it's a common enough trope now. I don't know how common it was back then, but you know, we're well on our way to something well-worn. Yeah, I mean, this is this was my vacation reading. Um, I hope you got, there was also some other reading. I, I, I read uh, Dan Schneider's uh, 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 Baby and Buddy, which is a children's book that he recently finished. Not too long. You guys could email him and ask him for it. It's about 45 or so pages with illustrations that he did. There are a couple of things, but I mean, not everything comes to my mind and I feel like I'm, I'm petering out now. So thank you for watching and uh, I'll, I'll have that Kendi show with Norman Finkelstein sometime in the next week or two whenever it's going to be up. Yeah, so thank you guys for watching. We'll see you soon.